Yeah, just trying to get through the semester. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Jonah. Hello. Hi, Mike. Jonah. Mike just joined too. Hi, Hi John. Hi, Esther. Good to see you guys. Yeah, um, there's Michael. Yeah. Yep, Michael. And I'm just uh, setting yeah. up streaming. It looks like streaming is working. So nice. When is your semester over, Esther? August fifteenth. Can't be. Oh, can't be quicker. Can't be faster. <laughs> can't be faster. Yeah. Hello, Eric. Hello, Jenny. Hey. Oh, hi, Jenny. Hi, hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. How you doing? Hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, session number fifty-seven. Did I get that right? Wow. I can't believe we've been doing this. Yeah. So this is great. That's we've been online, you know, a couple months now, I guess, but. Yeah, 57th session of Human Design yeah. Catalyst. We're going to continue on our channels by type. Um, I'm totally happy to do kind of a free form where we just talk about channels people have, but I also have book two of the channels by type material right here on my laptop, um, which is, this is a, a series. Yeah, so this is basically a series that Ra um, gave back in the late 90s and it's it's really cool he, i mean he goes into a lot of detail about the different um channels and the first one in the book too actually which is all the manifested and generator channels or the manifesting and generator channels is the 2034 so i thought that might be a, a fun place to start um, yeah since i know john is a 2034 is is he the only 2034 here is that oh no, yeah. i have it yeah you are also, oh, yeah. okay yeah you have a lot of you have, yeah okay I need to I need to look at all your charts again. I, I wish I I had them all just in front of me for these. So, be so yeah, I, I was looking at Barbara's today too, just looking at it, and I said, "Wow, she's got a lot going on." <laughs> yeah, I know, and only half of what John has going on. <laughs> yeah, only half of that. I'm, and I'm surrounded by you guys. I know. <laughs> yeah, John has yeah. ten channels. Yeah, mm. that's a lot of channels. We have a yeah. guest. Welcome, Trevor. Good, to, good to have you join us. Trevor is our uh, our resident quad right 63 oh, okay. and uh, he's been really involved in the in person uh, sessions and actually always has really great great questions and really um, yeah you, you know his his quad rightness is a really good um, complement to the more left oriented approach that I have. You know I'm almost all left and then Michael is quad left so i always i always like having trevor's input as quad right so um yeah so i think so we'll start with the 2034 so that would be an interesting one to start with so let's see what ra has to say and if anybody has any stories ideas about 2034s um oh thanks trevor yeah he just commented so if anyone has any any stories or anything like that but um here is the first point that Ra makes. The manifesting generator's movement is fast after yes. You go up to a manifesting generator and say, would you like to do this? And they don't have to go, uh, uh-huh. The sacral is connected to the throat. They can say yes. And the moment they say yes, they can act instantly. And instantly manifest in zero to 50 in four seconds, you say. Zap. That's the difference. An interesting one. I've actually heard that uh, manifesting generators oftentimes will just walk or just move or just take some action. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, just getting up and, and, you know, leaving the room or just, you know, slamming the door or just like yawning if they don't like it or, you know, taking some action more than just uh, kind of a guttural sacral response. Is that, is that true for, for the, for, I mean, you, you do you, do you find yeah. that that that's that's uh, true barbara or john i would i would say so um i i had to practice in the beginning before i realized that the manifesting generator uh might just move towards something or quickly just go right to the voice uh compared to the gut you know that response in the gut or the sounds so i practiced the sounds like I would do that just to say, it just didn't feel quite like I'd been doing that all along. Although I do, uh, when I'm engaging, I'm, I'm in it, I'm totally focused. 
but I can tell the one piece of it is the skipping step. I know, I just want to get to the end and I can so see, like my husband wants to go through, we do this first, then this first, and I'm like, you can get to that side so much faster. <laughs> if you just, it takes five minutes and you can make it an hour, you know, and I just want to do, 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 like right through it. So I totally get it, yes. And I could easily, if something wasn't, I, I would leave. I don't slam doors, but I certainly <laughs> do it quietly. And I'm also an observer on the Enneagram, so I'm not that, I don't use that much energy at all, so. <laughs> we, have, we have another guest. Hi, Hi Paige, thanks for joining. Hi. Paige is a 4-6 manifester, and uh, we're actually just starting talking about the manifesting and generating channels, and we, to start it off, we were, start, we're talking about the, the 3420. What, um, what manifester channel do you have, or do you not have a, do you have a, do you have a channel directly, do you have the 1222, is that right, or? Do you remember? Oh, you you're unmute? also muted. There, there, there oh, goes. sorry. I'm not used to Google. I'm used to Zoom. Let yeah. me quickly uh, pull up. I don't remember off the top of my head. Hold on one second. Well, and as you're doing that, I can keep reading about this 3420. Um, but yeah, we just where started. I, hmm? Sorry, where would I see the channels? Uh, if you want to share your chart really quick, you can, if you can click on share. Screen. Cool. Yeah. How do I share it? So at the bottom, it should say present now, unless I'm the only one that can present. I don't know. Does it let other people present? Yeah. It does. Okay, yeah. Great. Yeah. So, so kind of Hold at on. the bottom of the screen, it should say present now and you can click on it. And, um, thank you. Yeah. I feel like I'm out of my, my generation. Like, I think I feel like I should know how to do this. <laughs> No, I think I think Google oh, yeah. is out of the generation. If it were Zoom, it would be easy. I think Google. Yeah, I know how to do stuff on Zoom. Have the, uh, <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, no, it's not showing. But that's okay. If you want to just message it to me, also, you can send it to me. Every time. I'll do that, and then you yeah. can continue with your talk. Sorry for taking up some time. No, not at all. So we're just starting with the thirty-four twenty, the classic manifesting generator channel. We're kind of talking about how because the sacral is connected directly to the throat, there could be a direct action instead of like me as a pure generator, I pretty much just make sounds. So if I get, a, you know, an email, you know, even if I'm by myself, I sometimes just go like, ah, like I'll just make that sound. Like, eh, I don't want to do that or something, you know, or somebody asks me and I, I'm like, eh, you know, I just kind of make a sound about it. And for manifesting generators, they'll often either use words or take action of some sort or, lean forward or lean away or get up and start to move or I've noticed manifesting generators will already be kind of doing something like before I would even expect them to they're very quick like if I was like oh do you want some of these grapes they're already like reaching for the grapes or something as I'm saying it you know <laughs> if they really want them so another thing I kind of notice is when you're having conversations with people with that channel they'll like be on the edge of their seat if they're really excited like they can move up. It's a very uh, charismatic channel. I mean, it's, like, it's all about charisma. And if you look at the um, cross of the sleeping Phoenix, which is the incarnation cross that has the uh, 3420 in it, you know, they often look very young and vital and full of energy. And there is this, this real kind of special quality to people who have that uh, 3420. Um, so, okay. So, and then um, what Ra has to say about it is that the 3420 is survival and life at its most basic, responding to the environment and instantaneously manifesting as a response to that environment. And out of that root within us, which is integration, manifesting generator is the design of integration. Out of that comes two energy variations, the manifester and the generator, just as the male came out of the female. This is part of the way things evolve. So in the beginning, out of this combination grew these two energy fields. It says something to you about people who are manifesting generators and where their mystical connection is to many things. It goes very far back in terms of the beginning of the very beginnings of our human experience. So interesting, you know, he's talking about, I mean, this is kind of an interesting mystical idea that manifestors and generators came out of manifesting generators. You know, it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, you're presenting, Trevor, but it looks it looks like a dark screen, so I don't know. Oh, let me check the comments here. Okay. Huh. 
Well, anyway, I'll go back to my full screen here. So let me just read, and if anybody has any, I mean, I'm just going to kind of read some of, um, some from the book, and then if there's anything interesting and people have comments, please feel free to interrupt. I do not mind being interrupted at all. Think about the 2034. All of you have been doing designs and readings. Tell me how often you see that 2034. Well, quite a lot. And how often you see the 4323 and the 4037. You see them all the time because they're oppositions in the wheel. Anybody who has the sun in either of these gates, the earth is the opposite, or the nodes, or on occasion it's structured by the planets. But they're universally present, those three channels. And here Ra talks about the two seasons of reproduction. One of the things to recognize about the nature of human reproduction is that it had two seasons, the 2034 season and the 4037 season. Oh, interesting. I never even thought about that. 4037. Yeah, I don't know what he means by this, but these are the seasons of reproduction. You can see that it's a given that these three channels must be part of the human experience and design. Essential ingredients that you always have to, that always have to be in abundance more than other configurations. That is, the 3420, the 4323 form a single definition. The individual freak being busy. It's fun to think that the gods want busy freaks running around, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely essential for the earth that there are busy freaks running around. I think that's very cute. And if you look at those three channels in a graph, just as a design, what you have is a split definition emotional manifester. Well, no, I think he means manifesting generator because, yeah, I mean, the sacred will be defined. Anyway, a busy freak running around every once in a while trying to connect to the community. <laughs> <laughs> the traveling salesman, the busy freak running around, drops off its jeans through the 4037. <laughs> 2034 is the busiest thing you've ever seen. And we call it charisma. Oh, that's so funny. I am busy now. Everybody has been propagandized from the moment they came into the world to be manifestors. You know, here, I think when he talks about them, he called it an emotional manifestor. I think this is because at this point in Ra's work, he still wasn't totally sure about the manifesting generator. I mean, he does call them manifesting generators at certain points, but he also kind of calls them a type of manifester. He's not really like, like he considered them an emotional manifester in that previous paragraph. It's kind of interesting. But he talks about how they can only manifest in response. Um, and then he says at, that everybody is conditioned to be a manifester. Do this, do that, get that done. Everybody climb that ladder. And then you get a 2034, and they're coming in on the regular. Every Gemini season, here comes one. Every Sagittarian season, here comes one. And they come by the <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands. That 2034, what, what is it? It does not say, I know what I'm busy about. It doesn't have the 57. It does not say, I'm doing it for myself. That's the 10. It simply says, I am busy now. And we call that charisma. You see, we love seeing busy, busy, busy. <laughs> Keep on keeping on keeping on. That's our nature. So uh, now I'm curious um, if you could refresh my memory, Barbara and John. What are the other, and I could pull up your charts too, but do you have the 10 or the 57? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. John no. has all of them. He has all of them, right? I think I remember, yeah, it's right. like a little bundle. And I remember yeah. when he did that from our reading. So, okay, so that's an interesting comparison then. So Barbara with that yeah. 3420, without the 10 or 57, right. it, makes, you know, it makes that sacral response even more important because, you know, I mean, it's always important, but if you have that 57 and the 10, at least you kind of know what you're doing and you know that you're doing it for yourself or it has some relevance, right? Like the 10 is kind right. of, I'm gonna, you know, it's gonna be about me. And that 57 yeah. is, I want to know about what, what I'm doing. I want to have insight into it and have that splenic awareness of it. But that 3410, there's no you know, awareness center directly connected into that. Right. So, I do have my spleen defined. Right, but it's going to with be the 1640 or the 4816. Right. Uh, and I have the 4323. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And so then the seven, I'm a single definition and yeah. a 731. Oh, so so through the throat, yeah. the throat is really just such the yeah. hub for you. I mean, it is the hub of the yeah. chart in general, but for you especially, you have right. sacral to the throat, right. spleen to the throat, ajna to the throat. Yeah. And the 952, I think, helps me focus more uh, that I only focus, I find something that I really enjoy and I focus on it. So I'm busy in those things. I don't scatter. I'm not a... That's a good point. Having that kind of format channel really does keep it 
you know, right. dominates the chart. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's so, it's so interesting. So because you have the 4323, I'm not sure if it would be the same benefit, but there was an experiment I wanted to do with John, which the offer still stands. I never did it, but I, I've, I've been connecting my 3420 friends with my 4323 projector friends just to oh. see as an experiment. And so I did that with someone else, actually, another um, uh, 3420 client of mine who needed, who was kind of curious and for guidance. And I connected them with a 4323 projector who <laughs> knows human design quite well, but is not you know, exactly a professional in the industry. But it was a really fruitful connection because that 4323 does have a real special connection there. I feel like they're, you know, it's able to kind of understand that. So it's interesting that you have both of those, Barbara, that you um, yes. kind of get it. Yeah, and John and I connect very well. Yeah. And Esther, yeah. the three of us connect very Absolutely. well, and especially with the human design. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wondered when I'd heard that, Esther had mentioned that to me, that you were talking about that with John about, uh, the 4323 projector, and I could see the projector for the guidance. Now, my husband, Tom, has two of the same channels I have. He has the 4323, and he's a projector. Oh, so that's actually, and John and he have met and talked, and they know each other. Yeah, yeah. it would be interesting yeah. uh, even just to kind of set the intention and in talking of, you know, try to try to unlock some of, where where that energy should go because that you know 3420 is such a powerhouse has so much energy it's just like i think of 3420s as being one of the most energetic types i mean all the ones i've known can just work you know so much and get so much done and busy 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 yeah i didn't realize how much of a multitasker i was mm. until i started <laughs> looking at that because i am always doing this while i'm doing that i'm constantly moving Mm -hmm. I, I do it very low key. I'm not real outwardly. I don't know, Esther and John, if you would, you see me, I'm probably not like, you know, wildly busy. I, I have more of a, a relaxed nature. Yeah. Yeah I, would, yeah. I would say that. I would say that you're more contemplative about the things that you yeah. do rather than just reacting mm -hmm. to just something and, you know, yeah, but, but Barbara's, yeah, you're very unique in your design, it's true. And that, I guess the, the, nine, the 52, I'm switching that around, right? 52.9 is probably a piece of that, I think so, because it does help me focus more, so I would say and that. I had that the 52, mm -hmm. so when we yeah. saw their... The stillness. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Yeah, and, and John, I, I, it's John, I, I, I would like to follow up on that. I do recall mm -hmm. that as much as I've been kind of consuming a lot of stuff of late. I mean, a, a, God, it's a exploding with ideas and stuff I want to do from a work standpoint, but it's just so all over the place. It's somewhat frightening to be in my head right now. <laughs> so I, having guidance, I, I lean on Esther for for some of it, but uh, yeah, I well, I'm uh, still totally happy to connect you. Uh, maybe we can just email after this, and I'm not sure if I yeah. have your phone number, but if we start by texting, and then I'll just text my projector friend and ask um, if she'd be interested in that, or just kind of say, Oh, we have another visitor, excellent. Mm -hmm. Hi, Agnia, welcome, welcome, thanks for joining. Um, Hello. Yeah. No, I think that would be great. We're just talking about 3420 manifesting generators and um, how they experimenting with being guided by 4323s. So, John, let's just uh, email or text I'll, after this. I'll definitely follow up with that. Yeah, and I don't think I have your phone number, so if if you just yeah, email me, or if it's yeah. in your yeah, if it's in your yeah. um, like signature on the emails, then I can text yeah. you and I'll set that up. So I think it's just a fun experiment. I just like. Uh, I just like that experiment, just seeing seeing what comes of it. Okay, well, um, let's see if there's anything else really interesting on the 2034 here. Um, and then we can move on to some other channels. So well, let's talk a little bit about the 34th gate. Here's an interesting one, because I have gate 34. So this is a, a chapter header from Ra. The 34th gate. It is empowerment, and it is basically asexual. 34th gate, it's asexual. 
It's not to say that it can't be sexual, but the only way it can be sexual is when you get hit by the car. Weird. I wonder what he means by that. Sexual in certain situations was basically asexual. It's a fundamental power mechanism. It's truly the gate of empowerment, and it's one of the most powerful life forces we have in the body graph. I wonder what he means by when he gets hit by a car. Maybe he means they're so busy working that they have to actually like be in bed for a while. <laughs> I mean, that's just a, that's a pretty funny idea, right? Um, or like meet impact. I guess, yeah. Or it has to, you have to shake him out of that. The capacity within the 34 to release its power. Wow. He's talking about how powerful it is. So when it gets to the throat, you have to recognize what a sacral center does. Other than the solar plexus system, there's nothing more powerful. And even the solar plexus system has to take authority in terms of responding from the sacral. All right, so he's just kind of talking about the dynamics here. We, we know that stuff. Um, okay, here's one. The ego connected to the sacral overworks. So if you're single definition with a defined ego, that sacral center connected to the ego, the ego does not know how to handle that power of the sacral. So the sacral starts saying to the ego, work, you'll eat later, work, you'll rest later, work. <laughs> Don't let go, just work. So that's a defined ego. A defined ego with a defined sacral in a single definition, I guess he's saying. Um, okay, well, we'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see if there's any other, you know, and for next week, I should just go through because Ra has a lot of tangents. I should go through and just prepare some of the more interesting bits. Um, but we can also, I mean, if other people want to talk about what they've observed, like I know uh, I was having conversations with Mike the other day about what he's observed with the, um, you know, 2034. I'm happy to make this more of a discussion as well or ask questions of each other. So, okay, well, let's go on to the next channel then. I, I think if th that's all, because he, because he, Roz is talking about other things now. He's kind of talking about, he's using it as a launching off point. Okay, so the next channel we have in here is the 1222. Do we have anybody that has that 1222? Um, I know C does, but C wasn't yeah. able to join us today, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have the gate. I have the gate, but not not the channel. Yeah, twelve. Yeah, I yeah. have gate twelve. Mm -hmm. Jenny has gate twelve. Yeah, Ra has yeah. gate twelve, but not the channel. I have the twelve twenty-two. It's interesting. C does too, because he's also a four right. six. Well, that's what I was saying when I that was my guess. Was I, when I was asking? I was like, I think you have the twelve twenty-two. Okay, perfect. So Paige has this. So this is an interesting. And you you can feel free to comment at any point, Paige, if any of this okay. rings true or not or anything at all. So okay, so uh, the twelve twenty-two, the channel of openness, a design of the social being. Of course, the funny thing is it has to be in the mood to be social. <laughs> it's either in the mood or not. You know, it's, it's, it's a moody channel. Um, so, let's see. Let's just read what he has to say about it. I'll just start at the beginning. We go from the integration, that, you know, 3420, which is the combination of throat and sacral, the manifesting generator, and we come to a pure manifesting theme. Pure manifesting in the sense there's no sacral involved. What we're dealing with is the emotional manifesting channel of the 1222. Now, we did look at the 3536 last week, which was the other emotional manifesting channel. The theme of anger and the strategy of informing. So let's be clear that just as we've seen with the 3536, that emotional manifestation is the most dangerous, poisoning, and chaotic potential of the unaware <laughs> emotional system. It can simply blast off, and it does. And it doesn't blast off only into space. It blasts off into everybody else that's around it. And we know the nature of the manifestor is the theme of anger. The moment you connect the manifesting theme directly to the solar plexus system, you have the theme of anger as rage. We know that we're dealing with a pure manifestor and they have the basic strategy. And that strategy is very important for them. That is, they must inform before they act. So you have a job. You're a manifestor. You want to quit. You can quit at any moment. You're a manifester. You can slam the door. But you're only going to meet resistance and problems. The reality is you need to inform before you act. So the manifester tells somebody they're working with, I'm thinking of going. I may even go today. And that person says, go for it. And off the manifester goes, and there's no resistance. 
However, the 1222, the channel of openness, this is conditioned by emotional authority. This is a channel rooted in emotional authority. I'm just gonna pen my, thing. okay. So, and the emotional authority says it's not possible to be spontaneous. This is not the spleen. It's not possible. This is, ge this is genetic continuity where it's not possible to be spontaneous. You have to wait out the wave. Which means that in order for the emotional manifestors to, to successfully live out their type, they have to be able to go through the wave before they inform. So you're in your job and you're an emotional manifestor and you hate your job. Don't inform anybody of that. Because of course, you're only in a place in your wave. You may discover a day or two later that your wave changes and it moves upwards and that you really do love your job. And if you blurted it out emotionally in the down end of your wave and you said, you know, I hate this place and I want to leave, chances are you're going to get fired. The emotional system is sickest when spontaneous. You'll discover that days later that job feels okay for you and you're up in your wave and that there is no need to inform anyone and there's no need to lose your job because of it. It's only the spontaneous that is destructive to the emotional being. What makes the emotional system the sickest is when it's rooted in the, ne the need, desire, or passion to be spontaneous. Okay, so I have a little comment here, and others might want to join in as well. And if you have any comments, Paige, I mean, does any of this ring true to you, first of all, or if you have any? I mean, kind of, I'm like thinking about my conditioning a lot when you, as you're reading that, because I'm like, oh, wow, like I love being spontaneous and I have trouble being spontaneous for sure like it's a struggle for me it gets me in trouble um but i think what came up for me a lot hearing that is i get very confused about being an emotional authority and waiting out the wave i understand that but then with like being a manifester and supposed to be acting on your urges and sometimes i get confused at my what's an urge and what's a process of my emotional wave because i feel like a lot of my urges feel emotionally charged and then I'm like oh wait I have to ride this out and then I like miss an opportunity to create or to do something does that make sense I heard that from another 1222 and I think that okay. at least in his case it's my friend in Seattle and he was pretty resistant to human design and when he first started hearing about it, he said well here's the thing you know I don't like to wait out my emotional wave because I might not feel like doing it later. So I just do it as soon as I want to. And I was like, well, how does that work? And he's like, works great. But I'm like, well, maybe, but also, I mean, might not work great for everyone in his life. He might be having a lot of impact he doesn't realize. He might be making right. decisions that really cause a lot of problems down the road. So, I mean, his point was, he said, that, like, he feels like, like on the one hand, he has regretted making decisions too early, like committing himself too much. So he stays in a place where he doesn't commit himself as much. But on the other hand, he said, well, basically I feel like there's a peak time where I'm like, I have all the energy ready and I have to act. And I feel this intense pressure to act. And if I don't, I might never do it. And that to me, I guess it could go two ways and only the manifester will know. On the one hand, if that's acting out of this charged up energy, that to me sounds very impulsive. On the other hand, if there actually is clarity there, I mean, the only way to really test, like, I, I would put it a different way. I would say, once you have clarity about something, then you can act on it when the time is right. And knowing when the time is right, or even when the time isn't right, because you're a manifester, you can do it anytime you want. I mean, that's kind of the point. I guess manifestors can just interrupt whatever's going on and just be like, but it's coming out of a place of clarity. And so once the clarity is there, it's a very clear action. It's not a confused, muddled action. There's no take backs. It's like breaking up with somebody and then two days later being like, oh, actually, you know, <laughs> or whatever, right? But if there's clarity there, you're not going to go back on it. You're just going to only move forward from that direction. The other point I, I was thinking of is I know a 1222 manifester, a different one in Seattle, who I was getting into human design to a degree, and they um, were like experimenting with it, and then they went to buy a car and they got this like really fancy sports car that was like way out of their budget and they did it the same day and I was like so you didn't wait for your emotional wave and they're like yeah I did I knew I wanted a new car I was completely clear I wanted the car and then like for like the next week they're like this car is awesome and then like two weeks later they're like I have to sell this car I hate this car everything about it is wrong so like there can be like this honeymoon phase afterglow that can trick you into thinking it was right for you 
from making that really impulsive decision. The other thing also, just as a little side note, is when you said that like, manifestors are supposed to follow their urge, I would never use the word urge. Like, like it's not really a question of like, do you, you don't initiate from an urge. You initiate, if you're splenic, from the splenic awareness that tells you, or if you're emotional from the clarity, from the place of clarity. I don't think there's really much of an urge there. I feel like urge is a little more like, you know, like it's just a different yeah. thing. And then also depending on what channels you have, there's different kinds of initiation. And this really fits the topic of our talk today about channels by type. Like um, an interesting one would be like, what are you actually here to initiate? Being the 1222, I would think it's here to initiate romance, here to initiate, um, you know, poetry and here to initiate connection, here to initiate mutation, here to initiate change in people by mutating them. You know, that's what it's really here to initiate. And so say it's something about like business or something that doesn't really have to do with the individual. It's more of a tribal thing. You're not really here to even initiate business. I mean, you're not really here to initiate in the tribal sense. I mean, even romance isn't really a tribal relationship. So it's kind of like, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the emotional clarity is going to make you clear about what you, what kind of changes to help initiate or what kind of, maybe even what you want to express to people, what, what you have to say. Maybe you get clarity about what you have to say, and then when you initiate that, the, the strength of that clarity carries through in the frequency of your voice. The people pick up on it. This isn't something impulsive. This isn't something, this is something that Paige not even has thought through, but has felt through, feeling all the different levels of it and all the different sides of it. And then it comes through with that much more force and has that much greater impact. Because manifestors are here to impact. And the impact partly comes from that clarity of that frequency. Um, mm -hmm. I saw there's a comment from... That's incredibly from, helpful from oh, you. Oh, I mean, that's just, it's just ideas. I mean, spont spontaneous ideas. But, oh, do you have one, Eric? Please, go on. This will be interesting. So my beloved, this is her only channel. Um, ah. Yeah, this is her only channel. She's got nothing, no, nothing else. This is what, this is literally her life. And she's a four, six manifester as well. Oh, fantastic. Uh, th 30, 39 years old. So she's on, on the roof currently. And the, <laughs> I, I'm sitting here laughing to myself because Jonah, like you're so spot on. You're so spot on. Like she does not know what she feels in any given moment, in any moment. There's no truth right now. No truth right now. She will just say the craziest stuff and then she'll know not to act on it yet. Because we're so deep in human design, both of us. So yeah. she'll just, I just feel like I need to share this. Can of I just share it? Of course. It's like, beautiful. Yeah. I love to hear this. It's yeah. amazing. It's amazing to witness. And what you said, and, and this might bring clarity to, to, to everyone, if you ever, uh, you know, are running into a, a, a 1222 manifester, it's really clear to, to me after spending so much time and speaking to her every single day, it's so clear to me that they have, she has no idea where she's going right now. She just doesn't know. She will know over time. And anything that's, that, that's meant to be initiated will come back. So she doesn't have to rush anything. She's just like, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. And so she just lets it go. And then if it's supposed to be initiated, it, it'll come back. It'll come back. Mm -hmm. So we, she, we just, we just wait, we just wait it out. Yeah. That's <laughs> a, that's a really good point that because initiating doesn't really have to be in the flow in the way that generators have to be in the flow. Like really it's more to do with the clarity that you're initiating from because yeah. Oh, that's a really nice, nice comment from Paige as well. Um, yeah. And then, and that's so, yeah, super, super spot on, uh, Eric with that, that, that they'll come around and that because the manifestor's superpower is their ability to be a flow breaker. You know, I call them flow breakers or it's like the ability to interrupt and that's okay. Like that's good. It's actually good too. It's like a, a good example would be, um, you know, when, when I was doing a lot of business entrepreneurship stuff, and this would probably be more of an example for like a 4521 manifestor, more on the tribal side and so on. But um, when I was doing a lot of business stuff, you know, the investors would ask, why do you want to do this business now? Why not next year? Why not last year? And like, shouldn't we try to, and I, I feel like a lot of them were trying to get in the flow or the sync, like in sync with the timing of things. And I feel like if a manifestor is really clear on their product, I mean, sure, they're going to, 
they're going to be smart about when to launch it. But there's something powerful about just the force that they can attract attention, you know. <laughs> oh, I also have just I have so I have two side notes, two side comments. One is we watched me and me and Jenny and Mike watched um, the party, the Peter Sellers movie. Has anyone seen that movie? It's a classic movie from the '60s. It's so good, and he's a manifester in real life. And I feel like it's the best manifester movie because. Basically, so at first I was like, is this a projector movie? Because it's this plot of the movie is he's accidentally invited to a party. He's like a bumbling, like Mr. Bean type character, you know, who's just kind of destroying everything around him. And at first I was like, well, he's not invited to this party. So obviously it's some kind of projector thing. Like, what is it being invited? No, I don't think so at all. Because I remembered back to what Ra said. He said, oh, you projectors think it's bad when you haven't been invited? Manifestors never feel invited anywhere. Even with real invitations, they get there and they're energetically pushed away. And so it's like, imagine walking every cafe you walk into, every gas station you walk into, you just feel this resistance from people. Why are they here? You know, what are they doing here? And this incredible push just because of the aura. The manifestor aura has such a dense, you know, reflect, uh, not reflective, but whatever you would call it, it kind of, uh, it's just, repellent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Dense, you know, repellent aura. And um, so, so watching this Peter Sellers movie, and he is a manifester in real life, and I couldn't help but think of it because he goes to the party, and it's all about the impact he has. Like he just yeah. he finds a control panel for this really fancy house and starts pushing the buttons, and the fire gets really big, and like the water starts to flow and pour everywhere. And, I mean, it was just it, the whole movie is like a manifester impacting people like strangers, basically. Yeah. I would imagine that a manifester, I thought of this because we do have a few friends that are manifestors. In fact, one, uh, Deborah, Esther, and John has the 1222 as well. And she has three channels coming from the emotional, the solar plexus mm. and a manifester. And she has, I believe, the 45, she has the queen. I'm not sure if she's got the full channel. Uh, but she, yeah, I think just 45. Yeah. Your kids are emotional as well, right? Defined? Yes. The whole family of four of them have the solar plexus defined. Mm. I thought that that had to be pretty wild because you could be on a different wave at all times. You know, and the that's whole something, Well, that's something that, um, that uh, Chet and Parkin said is that when he would do groups, he would take all of the solar plexus defined people and have them drum and sing together because that helps synchronize them to a wave, at least temporarily. It helps synchronize okay. them to the same frequency. Otherwise it can be really yeah. jarring having all the different where they are in their waves, you know? Yeah. And I don't oh, know if I necessarily good. agree with that because I'm much more of a independent, like it's okay if one person's up in their wave and the other's down, that's fine. Yeah. But, yeah. But, and but and you can feel it. Yeah. The manifestor to me, in order to do what they do and they're the only, for the impact, uh, can't have the same aura as a generator or projector or anything. They almost have to have the closed off to repel or to keep people from interfering with their manifesting, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that Absolutely. made total sense to me mm -hmm. um, that in order to do what they do, they can't have that uh, impenetrable well they, well, they can't have everybody gluing to them because that would yeah. slow them down. Interfering. It's like you're holding on to yeah. you and you're just getting slowed mm -hmm. down and you can't go where you right. need to go. Right, so just yeah. let me do what I have to do. Yeah. My, my other comment is that because I have gate 12, and this might be something Jenny and others with only half the channel um, might notice, I've noticed, so I've noticed this 1222 a lot through transits, but even primarily just through aura contact, through an electromagnetic. And I notice it's strongest if the other person has an undefined solar plexus with gate 22, because then we're amplifying it the absolute strongest. We both have undefined solar plexus and we have the electromagnetic. So it's extremely, well, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you can experience it, Ag Agnia. She's saying, uh, my solar plexus is undefined along with all the others because she's a reflector. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. you can definitely experience it through transit. So just notice when the 1222 is lit up when it's transiting. Like right now we have um, Neptune in gate 22. So notice when something comes along and you'll, you'll feel it. Because we all get to feel all of them basically at different times. But I, I was going to kind of share my own comments on what I've felt about the 1222, the quality of the emotional wave. Oh, 
And Mike points mm -hmm. out we all get to have it through transit next week, lasting till October. Okay, okay great. So we're all going to be in that same moody, emotional, uh, you know, romantic, poetic uh, <laughs> place. So, um, so for my personal experience, so here's the other interesting thing. So I have completely undefined solar plexus, and I only have one gate pointing at the solar plexus. So in a way, it's like the classic, um, it's kind of, I mean, Ra talks about it a little bit, and he basically says when you're completely undefined in that center, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's like it can be the extreme. Like, And the, on the one hand, he actually said that they can be too dumb to even consistently follow the not-self strategy as not-self. Like, even as not-self, I may have been confronting more than I realized it because I'm just so oblivious. Like... Anytime. Oh, and I know you also, John, have a com you have a completely undefined solar plexus. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. And so One anytime, right. And anytime there there's so little um, channels or gates. I mean, I guess of course channels, but even so few gate activations. I look at it like a complete blind spot. Like there's no visibility into it. On the other hand, it can be really extreme, and so I continue to get more and more information out of it. Like that's one of my greatest areas of learning. I really see what they say about the undefined centers and so on being places of learning. Um, so I'll say as the not self, I've had some of the most extreme emotions which shocked me to find out I was wired cold. And I'm now realizing that they were pretty much exclusively from interactions with people that had gate 22 particularly in an undefined center, because then both of us are undefined. So both of us, I would say that's one of the most volatile combinations there is. It's an extremely volatile one because the emotional wave of the individual happens through being triggered. It's a big buzzword now, and everyone talks about triggered and trigger warning and so on. This is the channel of being triggered. I mean, I guess also the uh, 3955. And, and all individual circuitry in some sense can be triggered. Like 2838 can be triggered into struggle. 4323 can be triggered into knowing or not knowing and so on. But this is like emotional triggering where literally I've been, like I had a girlfriend for four years who had gate 22 and the undefined solar plexus. And everything would be fine. It'd be fine for weeks. Literally, like you wouldn't even know there's anything emotional because it gets locked. It's, it's a spike lock mechanism. That 1222 gets locked in. And we're just feeling great. And then we would be like out. I remember once we're out at a gallery and she saw her ex-boyfriend. All it took, seeing her ex-boyfriend. And I didn't even know. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know this guy or anything. But she just immediately, I could tell she was triggered. And I felt it. And I just said, hey, everything okay? She goes, mm-hmm. Literally, like we were in like this like silent treatment, extremely mm -hmm. negative, like your guts being ripped out through your heart feeling for like two weeks after that. Two weeks after that, like until something else <laughs> triggers it. Like you just get stuck on a wavelength and you cannot change that wavelength. You're just stuck there. And so like two days later, I'm like, hey, uh, are you, you feeling okay? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. Like that's just like how it is. Like you're just there and it's just never going anywhere until something else happens and who knows what. It can be the littlest things in the world. I remember um, there was another time when I had, I had gone to pick her up Everything was going great. Everything was, we had a really sweet time, everything for days, weeks. I mean, it's like, it's out of the blue. Like it just completely shocks you. And we we're going to go to a jazz club and I was going to go pick her up and she was going to meet me at the jazz club and I hadn't realized it. So then I had messaged her and said, Hey, I'm at your place. And she's like, well, I'm at the club. And then I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. I'll be there in like 15 minutes. And then it, like, is that cool? Like no response. And I start to go, uh Oh, and then it's like, don't bother. And like, we don't see each other for another week after that. Like, I'm just saying like, and then this might be an abnormally extreme example because we were, this was before human design and we were both like very reactive. But I mean, I'm just saying like that frequency, it, it locks in and it doesn't really change. And sometimes it can be so intoxicating. Um, it could be like a feeling of romance and of mystery and of, um, kind of, I, I, it's hard to explain, but it's like the feeling you get from like a fine wine or poetry or anything, you know, it gives a real juicy, just sumptuous, full kind of feeling. I mean, like we were, like we explored last week about how the solar plexus is where sexiness comes from. It can be a really incredible thing, but then it can also just get stuck on a certain frequency. And it's like, it is so hard to change it. Like you cannot mentally reason your way out of that. And mm -hmm. of course, before I knew human design, everything I was trying to do was trying to figure out what's wrong. 
trying to figure mm-hmm. out what's wrong. And I never figured it out, you know, because you can't, <laughs> you literally can't. But everything I was doing was like trying to figure out what I did wrong, trying to like retrace the steps and go, well, and then like try to make, you know, undefined egos, trying to make promises. Well, let's just promise that when it happens in the future, we're going to blah, 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 blah. Doesn't work at all. I mean, now, th- thankfully I haven't had that feeling for a long time, but I think now if I had that kind of electromagnetic triggering, I would at least know, okay, this is individual circuitry. It's telling me I need to be alone. It's telling me I need to yes. go for a walk. It's telling me, you know, cause that's the other thing is any individual circuitry, when that mood triggers, you know, and the mind is going, I got to fix this. I got to change this. I got to make it different. It's not surrendering. It's the opposite. It's like, I'm trying to like force it to be different than what it is. And so, you know, I remember it's like, it's like a bad joke. I remember, you know, thinking that when that happens, we need to talk it out. No, talking is the last thing you do when that happens. You need to go out and like stare at some anthill for a couple hours or something, you know, <laughs> go like get in touch with like the nihilistic, you know, existential reality out there. And, and then you start to feel better. But, yeah. um, but anyway, that was just my little personal anecdote yeah. about it. Anyone well, I had read Jonah Jones? that um, uh, in, I forget, it was Karen Curry's or uh, Chatan's book about the t- two people with the undefined solar plexus, that it's not the same as, uh, say, two people with it defined or one and the other, Sure. that sure. it was, it could end up becoming a more like a tennis ball, like bouncing back and forth. And one of you has to leave the area to stop it. Right. And I forget right. whose book it was I read that in. That, I said, okay, yeah. I could see that. It makes I, so you know, much sense because it just keeps yeah. amplifying. They're both amplifying. But it I just keeps say, going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. but that's mm-hmm. also as, you know, not, not self, because I think that's part of it is that when you're identified with it and feel like it's really you, then you, like, don't let go yeah. of it. And so, yes. I mean, it's still hard, but now when I start to feel really, like, heavy emotions or anything like that, I can kind of just – allow it to be and kind of breathe and maybe, you know, go, but I think in the past it was, yeah. And still, it's still hard, you know, it's, it's still, there's nothing you can mentally do to fix, to fix it or to change it. You really just have to, it's very physical. It's a very physical, physiological thing. It's, it really is chemistry. I mean, it is like this feeling of, of chemistry where it's, I mean, I have no doubt that what's happening in those situations is that there's actually a chemical cocktail that the brain is producing of, hor- of, of you know, hormones and other things that are literally just, like, our brains are basically chemical factories and they're constantly producing all these chemicals. And in those situations, the mind can't, I mean, outthink the, the chemical thing happening. And um, mm-hmm. I, just, I just think if more people knew human design, there'd be so much less medicalization and then people would understand things like bipolar and they would understand manic depression. They would understand all of these things in such a different way than instead of, I mean, you know, I just think people would start to look at, Oh, you know, Hey, maybe your kid just has gate 22 and you have gate 12. And every time you're around (laughs) each other, you know, you're creating this chemical cocktail of, you know, who knows what. So yeah. Okay. So here's, um, I, I guess, unless anyone else has more 1222 stuff, let's continue on with what Ra has to say about it. So, um, okay. So let's see what, um, okay. So oftentimes when you meet the 1222, you meet people who desperately want to be spontaneous and are always exploding on their wave. And so, you can help them with the simple, simple guide of sleeping on things. Just tell them don't make any decision until they've slept on it. Oh, hi. Looks like we have another, another <laughs> guest. <laughs> A slippery one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the first step for any emotional person. The first step towards awareness and clarity. Sleeping on things. Now, in some cases, it's okay, but it's never enough. For an emotional person... To know somebody else, they have to be in their aura three times on three different occasions. Oh, that's interesting. He's making the three times rule. I think I heard this a long time ago, but I kind of had dropped this one. It's, I mean, it's a little bit silly, but for an emotional person to know someone, be in their aura three times on three different occasions. It's a good rule of thumb. It reminds me of um, my friend Perry, who always likes to say, people take time to come into focus. They start blurry and they slowly come into focus. Um, 
That's the first thing, because out of that triangulation comes the ability to make some kind of clear emotional decision. Hmm. Sleep on it for most things. And so that waiting, that first step is to sleep on it. Out of that comes a natural growth. And what it ba means basically for the emotional person at the practical level is that most things in their life they need to sleep on. So, you know, they can say, I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. You know, I'm, I'm busy now. I'll talk to you about it tomorrow. Larger things take longer. Career and love, the larger things. That's when it's necessary to take the time for the emotional system to find clarity. It's not enough to just sleep on it. An opportunity may be so exciting that it's hard for you to let go of the high end of your wave. But you have to be able to give major things time. The minimum time frame for that, if it's about a person, it's around three different occasions. If it's about a career, take a week. Give yourself an opportunity to move through your wave. And it can be even longer. I mean, I remember um, I have a friend who's... Uh, so this was, this was one, this was a couple of years ago when I was experimenting in you know, human design. I have a friend who was kind of getting into it. And, um, oh, Paige says, I've had emotional waves last a year. Yeah, and also it's interesting because having the individual wave, it can get really locked. It gets locked in. It doesn't move as much as a collective wave or a tribal wave where it'll be moving in kind of a smaller wave until it hits a big thing and then breaks down. Um, but I have a friend who's emotionally defined. She's emotionally defined through the 3740, so it's the tribal wave. And it took her three weeks or a month um, now her, who is now her husband, proposed to her. And she was really experimenting about, about human design. And, and it took her about a month to say yes. You know, And some people would be terrified of, oh, this person will be so offended if I don't tell them. What will they think of me? And, oh, I might miss the opportunity and that. But she said, I need to think about it. And I remember she was asking me during that time. She said, well, how do I know when I'm clear? How do I know? And it's like, if you're asking that question, obviously there's no clarity. It's like the, the stress of like the tension of there not being clarity and like the nervousness about possibly making the wrong decision. But what I usually tell people is you'll know when there's no more nervousness about it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but sometimes they don't even know that they're so nervous about it. Um, okay, so let's see what else. Um, hmm. So, okay, the 1222. All right. The 1222 is the channel of openness, the design of a social being. It's the only social capacity inherent in individuality. And individuality makes up three different circuits. So this is the only social potential in individuality. The nature of the 12th gate, something we've looked at over the years, the very unusualness of it, because it's the 12th gate where the mutation took place in our larynx that allowed us to be able to develop the communicative skills that we have. And as such, this 12th gate, which is the gate of caution, one of the three gates of aloneness is also the gate of articulation. So what an interesting set of keynotes. The gate of caution, it can also be in caution. It can be not very cautious sometimes. They can say the wrong thing. I have 12-3. I know that sometimes I lack the caution and I end up getting myself into a real hole, digging myself into a hole, saying the wrong thing. And you know, I'm making it worse when I keep, keep going, trying to, you know. And it's also the gate of articulation, but that's a really funny one. How inarticulate it can be when it's not in the mood. Like it can be so articulate when it's in the mood, but when it's not, it's just like monosyllabic, like, nope, uh, not doing that. Give it a break. Mm -hmm. You know, like it doesn't want to, but then when it's really in the mood, it can, you know, use all of these $10 words. So, <laughs> and then it's one of the gates of aloneness. Isn't it a, a stop codon too? I think it is. Standstill. Pretty sure it's one of the stop codons. Yes. So, I mean, and, and, and I guess maybe the three stop codons are the three gates of aloneness, perhaps. I'm not, I'm not positive about that, but that would make sense at an intuitive level. Driven emotionally to be in love with anything. One of the most important things about the 1222 is that it's driven emotionally to be in love. I think it's very important to understand about it that it's driven emotionally to be in love with anything and everything. And if it cannot be emotionally in love, with anything or everything, life is a horror. Oh, I wish C were here because C loves to talk about just like having a crush on everyone. <laughs> like, or like seeing their appeal or being able to, to fall in love with. So there's this impression that one gets from the 1222 that they're in love with you. And I don't mean that in a physical or sexual sense. It's just the feeling that they really like you. If you meet a 1222, they're the most likable people. They're very mysterious creatures because you see on the surface that they appear to be either tribal or collective. 
They don't necessarily appear to be individual. Something interesting about them, you know, that socialness. Mm -hmm. They're kind of faking it. You can't tell the difference. A 1222 can seem very collective, this natural sharing socialness, but it can also seem very tribal. The love of the 1222 can feel supportive, and they don't give a sh about you. <laughs> Jonah, you know, I have I have this gate and I have something to share about Please myself. Please do. I'd love to hear. Please. Yeah. You know, um, this gate for me, because there's like, I have like this equilibrium in my interaction with things. Like I don't go really high and I don't go really low. And everything to me has some sense of the sameness. You know, like whether, you know, I got you know, made a lot of money or a little bit of money. I, I don't distinguish between those. I'm kind of flat. Sometimes my kids say to me, who are adults now, that, you know, you seem so cold, mom, sometimes. But I, I don't think that, you know, like, when they say that to me, I can't relate to that because I feel so strongly about things. But I think there's just this equilibrium for myself, experiencing things exactly the same so that I don't really move into these heights. So I don't know if, you know, this moodiness that's attached to that, I don't ever experience that. Well, so which which channel do, do you have then that, that or your Well, I have just the gate, the 12, the sure. gate. Well, so, but then do you have a defined solar plexus or no? I don't have a defined right. solar plexus. okay. So yeah. yeah, I think it makes a really big difference. Um, I mean, definitely, yeah, I don't experience, I mean, I have gate 12 and I don't experience the moodiness per se of, um, oops. I don't experience it as like a moody, you know, frequency that I get locked into. I mean, I definitely notice that much more if I meet somebody who has gate 22 and I spend a lot of time with them, then I notice it. Um, but I do notice though, is that sometimes I'm in the mood to talk or not, or the mood to be articulate or not. And I think that that's, but yeah, I think it's a really big difference. I mean, when it becomes a channel, it really takes on its own quality. And that's when it becomes part of the aura and the kind of yeah. life force, uh, you know, energy. Because I see an activated gate, a hanging gate as more of a receptor, or even if it is a, I mm -hmm. guess it is activated, but it's still, it's ready to receive from the other end of that. It's ready to plug into that gate 22 in, in our case. Um, and um, Esther's is her only gate on an undefined throat. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very similar for me. I do have gate 45 yeah. also, but it's, I only have two. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think it's just this, uh, you know, I, can, I don't know why I could relate to this so strongly, but I think that people have activation in the solar plexus tends to be more heightened in their reactions to things. And I kind of am more, even, you know, like I, I experience things as yeah, a lot of the sameness. That's how I, I can see describe. what you're saying. Yeah. Well, and also, yeah. Do, do you have individual circuitry? Do you, you know, because Esther has, an individual, uh, has, has two channels. Yeah, I do have some. I sent you my chart because I was curious about myself, you know, in terms of. Right. You know, be, yeah. I, I, do have, I do have your chart and I can pull it up. Um, I remember looking at it. I just, I look at so many charts every day. I just don't want to get them. I know. The 64. Yeah, I have that head yeah. activation, the Ajna, the spleen activation. Yeah, you know, the chart right here that I'm looking at. Yeah, and then the integration. Yeah. That's right. I'm split definition. Mm -hmm. I have your chart right here. Wide split. Wide split. Yeah. Very Would you say that was a wide split? Well, because it's more than one gate to bridge it. Because yeah. Esther's. Um, Activated from head to ajna, and then there's and then the throat is undefined, and then activated G center yeah. to spleen. Mm -hmm. So I would call that a wide split. Yeah, yeah, because the simple splits only require a single a single bridging gate. Oh, well, okay, so let's continue on with the twelve twenty two. Um, the outsider who is camouflaged, all they want is that they can recite you a poem, sing you a song, tell you a story, get your attention because that's what they're about. You see the 1222 is the mutative venue of the individual. This is the place where the freak stranger outsider is camouflaged. That's why they have a glow around them. And if you look at these people, they're the greatest mysteries because they look like everyone. 
they're not your typical individual. They don't have this freakish flavor to them. Yeah, it's not like the, uh, you know, 4323, which you find in Dennis Rodman or in like Whoopi Goldberg or people who kind of, you know, show off. They kind of let the, you know, freak flag fly. This 1222, it's the, it's the, the hidden freak, I guess, the, the hidden individual. <laughs> they have this camouflage. You look at them and... You think they have a humdrum, boring, dead-ass life, only to discover when you meet them that they've done the most incredible things and know the most incredible things. There's this guy I know in Germany who's a 1222, and so help me God, you look at him and he looks like the person in the Charles Atlas commercials. What, what are these Charles Atlas commercials? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. Oh, oh it's the bodybuilder. It's yeah. like the Oh, it's like the skinny guy who becomes totally strong after he does the training thing. <laughs> oh, I see. The skinny little runt kind of creature that everybody's ready to kick sand in their face. He looks like somebody who would back away from an ant. He looks like somebody who's just lost, totally, kind of just another grinder in the mill. And this guy was a jet fighter pilot for 25 years. Then he became a homeopath. And looking at him, you wouldn't see any of that. You wouldn't notice it. You would never have the impression that there was all this stuff. They're really tricky, these 1222s. They're the only freaks that can hide in a crowd. And the crowd likes them. That's their gift. And at the same time, they can be the nastiest, meanest, cruelest creatures you'll meet. They love nothing better than to turn away in that friendly aura and say, that jerk. <laughs> <laughs> the plateau yeah. spike wave. <laughs> yeah, no comment, right? <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, the plateau spike wave. Because they also have that within them, out of this gate of aloneness, this backing away from it, and this general distaste for the social. The channel of openness can also be a channel of being closed. It's a design of being social and of antisocial, and that operates in the wave. And remember that it operates in the wave of the individual process. Yeah, it's also, it's funny knowing um, fourth lines on that as well. And I'm not going to say this about you, Paige, because I haven't seen this side of you, but Ra talks about how you really know a fourth line when you've seen their meanness, because they're on a kindness, meanness wave totally separate from the 1222. Just in general, the fourth line can shock you. And I've had this happen when I've gotten close to them. I, I know that we're really good friends when I can see this mean side of them. They trust me enough to like, I'm like, wow, that's like shockingly mean. Like when the meanness of the fourth line comes out, be careful. Really, really surprising because normally the fourth line is so friendly to everybody and you're just like, this person is so kind and they're so generous. They kind of have like a Robin Hood quality. Like, oh, I know, I know some rich person with like a swimming pool. Let's bring all my friends to the pool. Or, I, you know, th th that's the other funny thing uh, that, you know, Ra said. He said, in your interaction with the fourth line, you're going to either, they're either going to give to you or they're going to take from you to give to the others who don't have it. It's all about the haves and the have nots for them. And so... If you find they're not giving you anything, don't worry. They're probably just giving what you have to other people in their network. <laughs> <laughs> it's just dynamic, right? But back to the 1222. So it's the plateau spike wave. And what's happening is they're spiking. Generally, the spike is down into melancholy. But it can also potentially spike upward into bliss. But usually what happens is that spike upwards is just back to the plateau. Just the kind of middle ground. <laughs> very important to see how that emotional wave works in the individual because it can be very misleading. At 1222, you can be with them at a social evening and it appears like they're only there for you. And you're listening to them because that's their gift. They get you to listen to them out of that friendliness. And then there's a shift in their wave and they can spike in the moment. What we call schizophrenia is something that exists exclusively in the stream from the 39 to the 55 to the 22 to the 12. Turn on a dime, go from the even plateau, flying downwards, and suddenly that person who's in your friendly emotional aura can absolutely get blown away. You're rhapsodizing somebody, and then you just turn your shoulder on them and get out of that aura and drop them like a stone. That's the capacity in the 1222. Um... Well, I think we're just kind of, stu I mean, this is such an interesting one. I, I don't know if we're going to get to any more channels today, but that's okay. We'll just keep working our way through them. Um, here's yeah. a really interesting point. The 1222, and I've heard this before, Ra likes to talk about this. He says the 1222 is the outside that is inside. The outside that is inside. So think about it. We have certain things, the, the larynx, the esophagus, the intestinal tract. This is the outside that's inside. 
because it's inside the body, but it's connected to the outside world in some sense, oh. all the way through, you know, the digestive tract. Yeah. The biology of this channel is significant. Channels have a biology. And the biology of the 1222 is the, bio is the biology of those things within us that are outside, that are inside. If you open up your mouth and go through the esophagus, through the stomach and intestines, all of that is the outside that's been folded inside. When you pour liquid into your mouth, it hasn't entered your body, even though it's in your body, because that's actually an outside. Yeah, it goes through the membranes, and that's how it actually gets inside, is through absorption, absorption through the membranes. And then the next, the next section header is eating disorders regulated by mood. So the 1222 is about the way in which we deal with food. That's why the 3955, its adrenalized emotional root, is where we find eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia, because this has to do with eating itself. It has to do with the recognition of eating regulated by mood. So that's more about the 3955, but this is the upper channel of that circuit group. Oh, and here's an interesting one. I've been really curious about this. I'm kind of skipping through. He's talking about that, but um, 1222s do not know how to breathe correctly. The 1222 has a lot of complaints about gas. In other words, this not being able to hold your breath properly while you eat and taking in too much air. The 1222s take in too much air. Hmm. And I've wondered mm. about that because I have only gate 12 and I've had... I, I've wondered about breathing and about working on breathing or doing breathing exercises, learning how to breathe more, breathing properly. Breathing correctly eliminates gas and regulates mood. Now, everybody thinks that because we breathe, we know how to breathe, but it's not true. It's not for everybody in this lifetime to breathe correctly. Or maybe we have to learn about it, I'd say. It's often the result of a gift, people who sing, for example. But the reality is that learning how to breathe for somebody who is emotional through this stream is absolutely essential. First of all, being able to breathe properly, you get rid of the gas. The second thing is that breathing properly will regulate the mood. It takes the edge off the moods. Mm -hmm. And of course, the most important thing for the individual, and the most important thing for the 1222 individual child is to never, ever, ever force them to eat, ever. Now with the institutions we have at the family level, tribal, where everybody's expected to be at the table at the same time sharing in the communal feast, this is exceedingly difficult for the individual. And the next header here, stuttering, bad breath, and digestion problems. They're forced to eat when they're not in the mood and they end up with a disturbed breath system, with bad breath. They end up with problems being able to speak. And instead of the 12th gate being the gate of articulation, it's the gate of stuttering, the gate of language handicaps, speaking handicaps. Look at the 12-4. You see the real dichotomy of the potential here, the fourth line of gate 12. The exalted is the prophet that can arouse the stagnant, and the detriment is the voice in the wilderness. I've met a lot of 12-4s with the detriment who almost always have language problems, many of them mute, unable to speak, most of them with stuttering problems. This is in the breath. That's why when stutterers sing, they don't stutter because they're breathing properly when they sing. Also, interestingly, so I had a, a speech impediment, which still comes back on occasion. I had to go to speech therapy for years. I have 12-3 and 12-6. Something I learned in speech therapy is that it's impossible to stutter when you whisper. Again, because whispering regulates the breath in some ways. And that's something that, um, for instance, Marilyn Monroe, who had a terrible speech impediment, was able to at least partly overcome it by always talking in a breathy voice. Yeah. It's so interesting how that works. I wonder if she yeah. had gate 12. Now I'm curious to check her, uh, her chart. <laughs> Singing or breath therapy is very helpful. So one of the things to see clearly for the 1222s is that you need to guide them. But remember, you're dealing with an individual. You cannot control them and you cannot directly influence them. But you need to guide them towards breathing properly. Yeah, it's so funny. He said, if you want to influence an individual, you just like leave something around on the coffee table and let them find it <laughs> themselves. <laughs> because if, as soon as you tell them to do it, they don't want to. As soon as you push directly, they're like, I'm empowered. You're not going to influence me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you need to guide them towards breathing properly. And what I generally do is encourage them to sing. And that's very, very helpful. In cases where I see there's a real difficulty, I encourage them to go to a good breath therapist. And by the way, when, whenever you recommend to anybody such a thing, 
I'm talking about somebody who can teach you how to sing or who understands breath. Purely mechanical. No spiritual shit attached. So that you really have an opportunity to learn how to breathe and you don't get all the propaganda that goes with it. I see. <laughs> the other thing is that any 1222 must use their voice because that's their gift. It's a gift of being able to express oneself and get the opportunity to be able to bring a mutation to others because they have this wonderful, friendly aura in which they don't seem threatening. The pure individual is always threatening, but you can sense the difference. The 1222 sneaks up on you. It's the individual stream of romance. I talked about how important love is to the 1222. Now that's true right down from the 3955, this stream. It is in the sexual language, the stream of romance. And being a stream of romance, it's built on building passion, building a fire. And everything about building a fire is that you're dealing with genetic continuity here. It's an emotional manifesting channel that can never be spontaneous, never. It's about being clear. But individuality needs to be passionate about things or suffer. So it means that inherent in the individual need for romance and passion is the authority of the emotional center that says, before you can consummate, you have to go through your wave. It's so important to understanding individuality. They need to be passionate about things. If they can't be passionate about them, it's of no value. You show me a 2838 that cannot find something in life they're passionate about, and they suffer unbelievably in this life. They will see life as meaningless, and absolutely purposeless. The individual must have something it loves, must have something it's passionate for. It's about the greatest love. Anybody who has faith knows the greatest love is for something you can never meet. Religions have been built on that the great love of the invisible Godhead. So that's where we get this romantic notion that the love grows because you actually don't get to meet the God or goddess. If you did, you wouldn't love them. So we have this whole tradition of unrequited love as poetry, falling in love with somebody you can never have, writing reams of poetry deep in the passion of that, the passion that grows as a fire. Okay, well, he's going on. Oh, and then I guess, okay, here's a couple more about it. We're, we're getting, you know, I, I don't want to overdo it here on the 1222, but... Oh, and then Michael says that sounds a lot like the 3955. Well, absolutely. The 3955 is the adrenaline that powers and charges up um, the moodiness and the fickleness of the spirit. Gate 55 is the gate of the spirit, which is really about uh, being enthusiastic. You know, the word enthusiasm in theos means the God within, having theo, having the God inside of you. When you get really enthusiastic and fired up about something and... So gate 55 is all about being enthusiastic or not, being spirited or not. And that ties in um, to the 22 and 12. It's part of the same. And, that's, and also what's interesting is Ra only had gate 12 from that stream. He didn't have 39, 55, or 22, just like me. Well, he said that he had a kid who had 39, 55, and 22. And as soon as he did, Ra said he was able to write and express and record and do his lectures so much more because he was constantly getting little daily charges from being in his kid's aura of that, you know, because really it has to get from the root all the way up. Like even just 1222 is not enough. It's, I mean, there is, there is emotional energy, but it's not the same as having that root energy that really adrenalizes the pressure to do it, you know, to, to get it done. So 1222 are the most acoustically sensitive people on earth. The 1222 needs to speak words of love. And it's not simply the words of love are poetic and soothing, but they have to be spoken and heard because it's an essential aspect of their nature. It's all about the tone. There's many ways to say I love you and it's all in the tone. And nobody is more sensitive to that than the 1222. You can tell when your lover says I love you and they hang up the phone that there's something wrong in the tone because the tone is everything. And if you use the wrong tone with a 1222, they are never, ever, ever going to forgive you. They will carry that with them to their grave. Nothing is more damaging to them. It's the, I know I can try if I'm in the mood. This is the voice that says, I know I can try if I'm in the mood. And the voice of the 12, that's the voice of the emotional manifester. And here it's so cl clear. I know I can try. I know I can try to be social. I know I can try to deliver the mutation but only if I'm in the mood. Oh, and then he kind of talks about his old trope of don't try to give a reason for the mood or you lose the creativity and so on. Then the next one, he calls them hidden antisocial secretive freaks. 
<laughs> you have different ways of expressing your relationship to the other through the streams of the solar plexus. But the individual is yearning for something to love. As an emotional manifester, they can't just take love. And that's what they try to do. But remember, when you're dealing with an emotional manifester, you're dealing with a truly uncontrollable force. They, they were deeply punished as children for their friendliness. Their parents see the other side, the antisocial behavior, the refusal to integrate. Nobody's more stubbornly individual than the 1222 because they can hide it. They hide it. That's part of their gift, but it's frightening to their parents. It looks like for their parents, they've got a normal child, and like all the other kids, they seem sort of friendly, only to discover that they're really antisocial freaks. <laughs> and there's nothing more secretive. You don't, even ha you don't even know they're a freak. You don't know all the things they've done. Classic for a 1222 to know a language other than its own, go to a place where it can hear that language, and never let anyone know that it knows the language. They just <laughs> listen in. <laughs> I had a 1222 friend who worked in Japan and he loved to sit on the subway with Japanese women going to work and listen to their conversations about him assuming he could never understand a word of what they're saying he said it was the most entertaining part of his life a typical 1222 and of course when they're talking about him being big and ugly and hairy and he understands everything they're saying and he's smiling because he's a 1222 so they have this aspect they keep things well hidden and of course, that's the whole thing about getting everything out of a 1222 before you have anything to do with them. The typical situation with the 1222 is to talk first. It's all about talking. And these are the kind of people who will tell you they love you the moment they meet you. They will talk romance instantaneously because it's literally natural for them. And they'll talk about their car, their dress, their dog, and their prospective lover all with the same glow. Okay, well, he's kind of going on quite a bit about this. Um, <laughs> How are we all doing? Should we um, should we wrap it up for today? I mean, there's anything else in the 1222? You want me to read any more from this or any comments? Anything? Uh... Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. The, the... Barbara, I... Ryan has this channel. Oh, wow. He's an emotional manifest. My grandson, Ryan. Yeah. It's interesting because that fits his character, really. Here's a, I, I can just finish up with a few more funny ones. I, I guess we'll just take it to the end of this chapter because that's a good place to end and then we can do another channel next week. But this is this is a pretty juicy one. It's a pretty fun one. I'm so, just going to yeah. confirm everything you've just said as someone who like lives with a person who only has this channel. It's like everything, uh, down to the breathing, down to yeah. the moods, down to the listening to how I say things, down to needing mm -hmm. to express. Like Everything is spot on. Wow. Well, that's all that's all raw you know i think he knew it really well too because he had gate 12 and he talks in other places about how he really had a lot of 22s in his life like i remember at one point he said um gate 22 will often love the sound of a 12's voice but they don't necessarily listen to the words they say they just like the frequency so he'll always have 22s say you know i put on your lectures while i go to sleep and you know he's like they don't listen to a word i said you know. <laughs> i was before you finished too it's like the the like antisocial social thing. I don't know, like the way that he explains it is so true to me and I don't even know how to articulate that. And then also like the freak but coming off normal thing. Like I have felt like that my entire life. I've like never felt so seen. The keynoting, he details it so well. I mean, very, uh, very extreme. So here's, okay, I'll just go through the next, I'll kind of skip through them because he, he really goes a long time on this one. Okay, the next header is seducing you into mutation. They turn life into a romance, into something you fall in love with, and that makes them the great, great seducers. They're here to seduce you into that mutation, to suck you into that individual vortex, and that's how they get you. They're Clark Kent. They put on this kind of innocent whatever, and you really sort of like it, and then they strip off their shirt and get you. That's what they're all about. I think he means there's Superman underneath. I take it. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Gate 12, breath problems. Okay. <laughs> uh, individuals are habitual with things they love. When you're dealing with a 1222, there's nothing more hilariously habitual than an individual. I'll tell you my favorite story of that. Many years ago in Spain, I was doing a course in an ancient monastery that had been turned into a five-star hotel. 
by a friend who had invited to come out and teach in this incredible restaurant and so on. The person I was working with, the Spanish teacher who was also the translator, was a 35-36. Ra is, now, Ra is saying, I I'm a pure individual for Ra with a 12. So going into the restaurant, I see that on the menu there's a salmon salad. It looked really good. So he decides to have that. Then they have lamb chops. I wanted lamb that night, so I asked for those things. Okay, so he does this thing. Now we're going to be there for eight days, and he loves food. He's a desire person. And I'm a passion person, Ra's saying. I have to fall in love with something. Oh, I see. So Ra's saying because this guy has 35, 36, he's desire. Because desire, he's using the keynote desire more for um, collective abstract circuitry. Like gate 30 in the collective abstract human experiential stream is a gate of desire. So it's always desiring new, something different, and something changing. But passion, Ra's saying, I'm a passion person. I have to fall in love. So when we come to the second night, I order the same thing. Now, you have to understand, it's a wonderful restaurant with a fabulous menu. I order the same thing because what I found was the time before it was perfect. Now, this is being an individual. Once an individual finds something, they fall in love with it, and they're instant instantaneously loyal to it. I've had the same breakfast all my life. I haven't found one better. I'm in love with it. I love fried eggs. Give me a break. That's what I love. You can eat cereal, muesli, anything you want. I don't care. I'm going to have what I like. <laughs> so the third night we go in, I order the same thing. And he goes emotionally apoplectic. There's a $10 word from gate 12. Right there. He tells me that I'm a deep embarrassment to him. He can't even stand watching the waiter come over. He said, it's driving him crazy. Would I please order something else? And I said, no, stop trying to condition me. I like this meal. We come in the fourth night. I order the same meal. He leaves the restaurant. <laughs> he didn't eat with me again for that trip. I went back each night until I left and had the same meal. It was so much fun to watch the waiter. I'd walk in the door, and the waiter would nod his head, and I'd nod my head. <laughs> That's being an individual. And of course, the whole thing is the individual falls in love with it. In the nights he wasn't there, the people would come in and sit down with me, and they'd say, what are you having? And I'd say, oh, I love this. It's a great salmon salad. And I mutate them, and they eat it because I'm in love with it. And that's the way it works. So when you're dealing with your mutative individual child who has the 1222, the fact they only eat one kind of cereal, don't turn that into a trip. Don't make them feel sick because if you give them something they didn't want because they were in love with the other thing, it's going to disturb them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyways, he goes on about that for a minute. Um... Yeah. That's one of the things about the 1222 and their dynamic impact on others. It feels like they're in love with you in that moment. But it's like this love of interest in you. They make you feel like you're very important. They give you their full attention. It's an incredible gift that they can just pull you in like that in order to mutate you, in order to take off their Clark Kent suit and zap you. So the 1222 has to be allowed to fall in love with things, which means that if you have a teenage 1222, they're going to fall in love with their teachers. They're going to fall in love with dreams. They're going to fall in love with all kinds of things. And they may, if they're manifestors, follow their muse. The 1222 emotional young adult, if they're living out their design, can inform those around them, look, I'm not going to stay in school. I'm going to quit. I want you to know that. It's not for me, but I do know what I love, and I do know what I want to do, and that's what I want to pursue. So let them pursue their own love. Then they can get the blessing. But they have to be clear emotionally beforehand. You have to let them go. You have to let them pursue their love. Oh, yes, love brings, bo it, it brings broken hearts. That passion that you develop for somebody, when the fire goes out, it hurts. There's a deep pain in the individual emotional process. It's all in the 55th gate, that deep pain that the spirit has not been found, the pain that love was an illusion and collapsed, that pain that's always lying there. For those who know about gate 55, it's eternally indecisive love. It's the, I know I love, I don't know if I love, I know I don't love, I don't know if I don't love. It's, it's continually loves me, loves me not, going back and forth. And it's, it never ends. I mean, it's eternally fickle. Um, the person I mentioned before who had gate 22 in the undefined solar plexus also had gate 55. And it's, there's something about that gate 55. It's, it's eternally fickle, but it's also mystical love. One of its keynotes of the love gates is mystical love, like the most mysterious, the most mystical love there is. So when the 1222 is clear in its emotional field, it's clear to be able to inform, then it has to be allowed its freedom. Now, most 1222s don't get that, so a lot of them run away from home. That's what they do. They're emotional manifestors, so they fall in love with the circus, or they fall in love with someone, or they fall in love with something, and they just run away. And then because they're just running away, it's not correct, and they carry that resistance within them. 
Yeah. When I speak of resistance, it's not just about the tangible resistance that somebody's always in your face. It's about the resistance you carry in your psyche from forces that don't let go of you and forces you cannot let go of. I'll show them, says that 1222. They're meant to go out to the world and into the world young. They're meant for that. It, individuals grasp things quickly. Whenever I meet adult individuals and they're at the cusp points of their lives, because they don't have a lot of time available to them, I always remind them of the individual truth. The individual truth is that if there's a four-year program, take seven months of it, get the basics, get all the basics, work out the ABCs, because without the ABCs, there's nowhere for the individual to go. So get the basics. Then you can have your uh, mutation. But don't go all the way, because if you go all the way, you're going to be deeply influenced and programmed by the structure. And you have to get out of it. Yeah, t mm -hmm. being individual, they're not here to take in even something like, you know, human design. Get the basics and go out and mutate it. I'm purely collective. I can stay in human design my whole life and just keep digging in and, you know. But these 1222s, they grab the basics early. They find something to be in love with. They find a passion, and that passion has to be encouraged. Individuals are not looking for you to care for them, to be worried about them. Oh, you're so young. Yeah, individual caring, they get so annoyed because it's disempowering. They don't want you to care about them unless they actually need you to care about them. And of course, given the way the tribe orchestrates, the way, the, the way you know, family and social communion, those parents that are willing to let their children who are 1222s follow their passion are abused by their peers. They're told they're failures as parents. So there's so much pressure on the parents to control that 1222 kid. We all understand that joke. We have to take away that heavy negative conditioning. There's nothing more par painful to a parent than being accused of being a lousy parent. It hurts. And to establish all this guilt and blame because of the propaganda of the tribe and the concepts of the collective, the collective that says, your child must be in school for this long. So we end up with these forces, these very friendly 1222s, turning into serial killers or enraged marauders. They come into your life innocently and thrash you with a deep, deep rage operating inside, a deep distaste for humanity. And living out the friendliness of the 1222 only as a mask to hide what's really underneath. And then the only mutation they can bring is negative. There's nothing more volatile than these two channels that go from the emotional system to the throat. The 3955 and the 1222. Yeah, I've heard that the 55 is the, the highest highs and the lowest lows of any emotional wave. The passion to kill, this is where crimes of passion are. Think about what that's like. You're an individual, you've got the 1222, you fall in love with somebody, and they don't have anything in that channel. So they experience it twice as strongly. In other words, you take them into your love and it becomes a mutual passion in which the partner rises on that wave. Then at the moment of consummation, the fire goes out. Now when that fire goes out to the one who doesn't have it, the pain inflicted by the loss of that, patient, of that passion results in most crimes of violence are committed by people who know each other. 25% of all murders in America are spousal. It's, yeah, scary. Right? So it's like the person who doesn't have that channel, they don't even know how to handle it. And they just amplify it even stronger and it just gets even more intense, probably even more so if they have an undefined throat and solar plexus. Mm -hmm. Ah. Prophets of light or violence. The 1222, at the same time, can bring us beautiful poetry and songs. But it can also bring us hate literature. It can bring us the voice of the demagogue. It can bring the siren song to violence. That prophet can be a prophet of violence as easy as it can be a prophet of light or good. Prophets of violence are everywhere in our society. And that is out of a failure to grasp the essence of how the individual operates and how passion operates and what it means to live out your type and grasp the essence of what the emotional system is. The 22nd gate is the gate of grace or disgrace. The moment it comes together, the moment the emotional system is creating this manifesting capacity, you've got anger, rage, passion, and moods. So it can be very graceful. It can also be a disgrace. And mutation is naturally destructive. It replaces the old order. Hmm. So how difficult is it for the adult 1222? If you're an emotional being and you're caught in the geometry of human design, you're lucky because the emotional person can bring such pleasure and joy in life. That's their gift to the rest of us, to those of us who don't have a defined solar plexus. We need the beauty inherent in that emotional wave. It's absolutely essential for us, the pleasure of it. 
It's our third, you know, it's the, oh, I see. After all, it's our third awareness. It's the potential of spirit awareness, our doorway to the greatest pleasure of all, the pure pleasure of being. So that's a nice point, that the, the undefined solar plexus people can be brought to this really beautiful you know, awareness. But we need to have an emotional system that's not controlled, but an emotional system that freely operates out of its wave and out of its clarity. Ah, okay, that's about it. That's about it for the end of it. Wow, that's a big, that's a lot of information on 12.2. Yeah, he says, right. well, uh, I'll end on this one really nice thing that Ross says. <laughs> that never forget that what they truly want from you, this is what the 1222 actually wants from you, is your blessing that says, it's okay that you're different. I trust your nature, go for it. Just don't have any expectation, just enjoy being in love with it. See where it leads you. And then you have a valuable human being walking around on this planet, changing all kinds of people's lives, making a deep impact on others. Yeah. yeah. That's very really beautiful. I like that a yeah, lot. That's a nice way to end it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very. Well, thank you all for attending this week. If there's any other comments or questions. Um, thank you. Yeah. Oh, is, it possible, is it possible? Is it possible to get access to that? To that. Oh, book? to this book? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Happy to send it over. Just um, I'll shoot you an email after. Thank yeah. you so much. I'll yeah. Just do it right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Say I will. I have to do it in like ten seconds, or else I. Forget. <laughs> I, have nothing to do. Great. I really just need to say, like, I am doing it. Like, I'm actually doing that right now, Eric. I'm actually. <laughs> oh, dude, you're awesome. I appreciate you. <laughs> All right, this was a lot of fun. Y'all are great. Thank and um, oh, and I to answer Michael's question about Lacan's lack, I would think Lacan's lack was that when we were talking about Gate Thirty, because I thought I've had that same thought. You know, Lacan has a theory of lack that desire never really wants to be fulfilled. It only just wants more desire, really. It wants to be continually deferred. It's like perpetually deferring getting its desire. And uh, on the one hand, that could seem like the individual with their, you know, falling in love with the unattainable. But on the other hand, I think it's also gate 30. It's, it's just desire to continually have something new, you know. So kind of a funny one. But... Um, okay, well, I think we'll just continue next week with Channels by Type. I think uh, we're in a good groove here. So we'll do yeah. Channels by Type uh, Part 3, and I hope okay. to see you all next week. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. It's been very interesting. Oh, it's really fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoying it. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.